I will describe uh, a case of balloon uncrossable coronary lesion, and I will give some tips regarding this. And in the process, I will describe how to improve guide support. I will describe the use of guideliners, microcatheters, and other ideas. So this is a case of a 62-year-old man who had osteal diagonal stenting back in 2007 with a taxis stent and sandwich diagonal stent in 2014. We don't have access to the old films. We had the reports. Uh, there is no mention of extending the stents to the LAD. He's coming with a recurrent angina on mild exertion. Uh, so we did this angiogram and we see he has a restenosis in the diagonal stent, but he has also stenosis in the LAD just past the diagonal. We can see it here as well. We can see the instant restenosis of the large diagonal. We see also stenosis of the LED just past the take takeoff of the diagonal. Um, so we started the case. This was radially. We did the six French Icari left four guide. We expected the case to be fairly straightforward. Our plan was to. Uh, double wire, stent the diagonal, uh, then eventually stent the LAD. So initially we double wired, we balloon the diagonals, diagonal with no issue. Then um, we tried to advance a balloon in the LAD with the purpose of eventually stenting it, but we could not advance any balloon into the LAD to our surprise, um, because it seems like a focal lesion, non-calcified. Uh, we could not even advance a lesion with through a guy. Uh, we could not even advance a balloon with the support of a guideliner. So this is our guide, and through it we advanced the guideliner, which I will explain in a, in a little bit. We advanced the guideliner over both wires, so we had body wire support and guideliner, and we could not advance any balloon, not even 1.5 millimeter balloon. So we started to think here, okay, what is the problem first in order to deal with it? And here I will show you. So one of the issues we thought maybe we're going through a cell that has a lot of fibrosis. Maybe that stent is extending into the LED and we're uh, going through a stent, stent cell that has a lot of fibrosis. So we tried rewiring multiple times, trying to go through different uh, stent cells using different wire shapes. We use BMW wire, Samurai RC, Pro Water, uh, multiple workhorse wires. But again, uh, the same issue. We could not advance any balloon. Uh, here is a thought process. So, uh, you know, it's important to understand this. I explained in a prior talk about uh, osteal uh, diagonal stenting. This is what we imagine they did. So their diagonal stent probably extended into the LAD in a semi-culotte fashion, like I explained in a prior talk. And uh, my preference when you do semi-culotte, so for osteal diagonal, if you really have to stent it, semi-culotte is one option where you make your stent extend into the LAD in cases where that angle is not favorable for a perfect T, and often it is. So you have to extend the stand in LAD and make it land in a semi culotte fashion. Usually I typically, especially for the LAD, I do rewire and balloon to open those stent struts. Now, if you don't do that, in theory, this is what can happen. You can get neo-intimal coverage of that stent across the LAD. And that neo-intimal coverage can basically create a wall across the LAD in that area and create a practically a stenosis, a scar type of stenosis into the LAD. Uh, this has been demonstrated in one very nice uh, paper. Uh, so a significant proportion of patients do develop neo-intimal hyperplasia in those bare cells. So we imagine that's what happened. We imagine that probably he, they, he developed some heavy neo-intimal hyperplasia in this area here. Uh, and, you know, there was some extension into the LAD as well. Probably because they didn't do this, they didn't do that rewiring and ballooning to open the stent cells back when that procedure was done in 2014, especially that he has double layers of stent here. So we think we're going through a heavy amount of 
tissue fibrosis and neointimal hyperplasia. So now that we understand what the problem is, we tried multiple uh, wiring here, you know, multiple wire shapes. It was always easy to wire. It just was never easy to get a balloon. We tried, you can see with the support of a guide liner, look at this guide and this is the guide liner. We tried a Mamba Flex catheter and we tried um, a Sapphire Pro balloon, one millimeter balloon, which is the lowest profile balloon. We still could not advance. This is the balloon here. It's getting hung uh, over that uh, fibrosis area. So I will explain, now that we've done everything basic, I will explain what are the steps and the ideas that you can use in cases like this to improve your support and allow delivery of devices, including in this case, the most basic device, a small balloon. So there are three axes of ideas you can use. And in case you're going through stent cells, there is a fourth axis of ideas. So the three axes are those, and always think through those. You don't have to do them sequentially. It's just have all those ideas and you can alternate, try one of those, then this, then go back to this. And you know you can play around with those ideas. So how to improve your support? One is to use guidelines, which we did. Another idea is to use body wire. And there are two types of body wires, as I will explain, side branch and coaxial. And you can advance guideliners over body wires, as I will explain as well. You can use the idea of anchor balloons in the side branch or anchor balloon in the main branch coaxially, as I will explain also in a little bit. You can increase your guide size and put inside that bigger guide, bigger guideliner, and you can do femoral access instead of radial access. Uh, now, that's the first idea. Second idea, is try to cross the lesion with the lowest profile devices you have or a profile that have more penetration or a screwing mechanism. So you can use the lowest profile balloons or you can use those support cath micro catheter that I will describe in a little bit. You can also do balloon rupture of those very small profile balloons. The balloon rupture can create a small explosion that can uh, actually uh, dissect that heavily fibrotic plaque and allow, allow you to advance a real balloon and uh, inflate it across it. The third axis is to do atherectomy. And you can do either laser atherectomy, particularly in heavily fibrotic tissue or rotational or, or orbital atherectomy in heavily calcified. And the decision um, regarding what to start with it depends on calcium. If you have a lesion, if we saw that this lesion is heavily calcified and we're not able to advance a small balloon, our immediate next step would not to increase the support and add guideliner and body wiring and so on. Our immediate next step would be to do just rotational atherectomy. Uh, but it's not heavily calcified. So we try to uh, focus on those ideas here. Keep in mind that those can be applied, but maybe at a later stage in the process. So those are the three big axes that I will detail in a little bit. The fourth axis when you're going through stent cells, uh, whether in um, this case or whether you're trying to cross into a side branch, getting a balloon into a side branch that you've, uh, and you've just stented the main branch as in bifurcation um, stenting. So you can focus on non-polymer wires, which wouldn't slip into a micro channel would, would, and wouldn't slip behind stent struts. You can keep changing tip shape, use parallel wiring, meaning to avoid going through a path of least resistance that may have an unfavorable uh, profile, you know, more fibrosis or, um, or it may, that wire may be going behind the stent cells. So if that happens, keep the wire there, eventually keep the wire there and get another wire while the first wire is plugging that path of least resistance behind the stent cells. So we can do parallel wiring. We can do super cross angle catheter, again, to direct you into different cells or to direct you into the stent cells rather than behind the stent cells if this is an issue, or you can use dual lumen catheter as I explained in the past. So let me explain some of those devices here. Then I'll go back to our case. So guideliner for, um, the uh, first, second year fellows, what is guideliner? Guideliner is a guide within a guide. 
Okay, so this is a six French guide, let's say, and inside it, you're advancing a five French guide. We call it six French guide liner, but it's actually a five French guide to fit into a six French uh, guide. So guide liner is a guide within a guide. It is a monorail guide, so we advance it like a balloon. So it's a 25 centimeter monorail, typically, uh, that you advance over a wire in a monorail fashion like a balloon. It is okay to advance it deeply. It used to be recommended that you can, because it's monorail, you can only advance it, of course, maximum 25 centimeter, but typically up initially, it used to be recommended to advance it up to 10 centimeter. Nowadays, I advance them more, but certainly don't advance close to 25 centimeter because then the guideliner will be fully in the artery beyond the monorail and um, you can start getting arterial injury or um, uh, wrapping with your other devices as you push through. So you can advance it deep. And I've had cases, RCA cases, where I'd, I've advanced the guideliner all the way into the posterior descending artery. There is one six French uh, type of guideliner called Guidezilla that's available in 40 centimeters. And that one can be advanced deeply, but it's only available in six French. Uh, there is one type, you know, there are two major brands, Guideliner and Guidezilla. They all come from six to eight French. Uh, there is one type called the trap liner that also has a balloon proximal to the monorail portion that allows you to trap devices during exchanges. That trap liner comes in 13 centimeter length. So you cannot advance it very deeply. That's one disadvantage of the third brand called uh, a third type of Guideliner called the trap liner. You cannot advance it very deeply. Um, so I want to describe how to advance it. So again, Guideliner comes in six, seven French and eight French mainly. Those are the three main sizes we use. Uh, and it's 25 centimeter monorail. And again, the size is a smaller than what it says. Six French Guideliner is like a five French guide. Uh, and keep that in mind as you're trying to do, for example, you cannot do in a guide liner, six French guide liner, kissing balloons because it's like a five French uh, guide, or, or you cannot do kissing balloon with big size balloons because it's like a five French guide. I will explain that in a little bit. So keep that in mind. Now, basic idea for first year fellows, how to advance the guide liner. So typically you have your guide in, you have your wire, you advance, you cannot advance the guide liner into the artery without having some balloon that will serve as a cushion, as a dilator to prevent that guide liner edges from injuring the vessel. So you need to have a balloon in place. But the way you do it first, you advance the guide liner over the wire all the way into the tip guide. Then you advance a balloon. Then you advance the guide liner over the balloon. The thing is you cannot have a balloon in place when you advance the guide liner because when you have a balloon in place, uh, the back end of the balloon will prevent you to advance the guide liner over it. So you have to advance the guide liner over the wire. Then you advance a balloon, a monorail balloon over, in, over that wire in a monorail fashion. Then you advance the guide liner over the balloon, okay? Now, an important idea, the, again, like I said, you can advance the guideliner as deep, you know, as close to 20 centimeter into the artery to get the support uh, over a balloon catheter. Now, the important thing, when you advance the guideliner, the guide and the guideliner become one unit in sync. The guide is wedged by the guideliner, so much so that the pressure that is displayed on the monitor is not the pressure coming from the tip of the guide. It's the pressure coming from the tip of your guide liner, because again, the guide is wedged. So the blood that's coming from the coronary, that coronary pressure is transmitted via this, not via this anymore. It's transmitted via this all the way into the guide. They are wedged together into your arterial uh, transducer. So uh, that's important because when we put a guide liner, we frequently, if we go deep, the guide liner can, uh, the pressure can get damped or, ventricularize, and that's important to recognize because that means that guide liner is um, in a small portion of the vessel or is across a lesion and it's causing 
ischemia. It's occlusive and causing ischemia. So you have to be careful. And typically the patient starts having chest pain when you advance the guideliner with ventricularization. So always observe, observe your pressure. Like the case I did where I advanced it all the way almost to the PDA, I wasn't getting, it was a big artery and I wasn't getting a ventricular, ventricularization. Uh, even if you get ventricularization and damping, it is okay if you do it in a hit and run technique in an intermittent fashion. So you get ventricularized, that's fine, but you use it to quickly advance your devices, but then you pull it back into a place where you are not ventricularized or damped. Otherwise, again, you will cause the patient to have ischemia, which is far more dramatic in the left main LED system where I would not allow more than a few seconds of ventricularization or damping. I may allow it a little longer in the RCA, but regardless, in any of those, it should be brief, intermittent, and you pull back quickly after you advance your devices into a place where you are not ventricularized. Uh, another thing is when you inject dye, again, because the guide and the guideliner are in sync, your dye will be injected selectively through this. So if your guide is in the guideliner is in the LAD and your guide is hanging in the aorta, well, when you inject dye, well, the dye will come out into the LED selectively. You're not going to see any dye coming from this area. That's another reason why if you're ventricularized, don't inject. Uh, you inject in a ventricularized occluded portion of the vessel and you will create VFib. So keep those ideas in mind as you're having uh, the guide liner. It's really like a guide extension wedged into the guide. Now, there are other techniques to advance the guideliner. Let's say I want to advance that guideliner. Uh, you know, I'm having trouble advancing my stent to, into the PDA, and I want to get that guideliner distally to obtain more uh, support. And I'm not able to advance it over a just a balloon catheter. It's not tracking. So you can use more aggressive techniques. One of the more aggressive techniques is to advance a guideliner as far as you can in a standard fashion over a balloon catheter, deflated balloon catheter. Then inflate that balloon catheter while being partially in the guideliner. And as you're deflating the balloon, you suck and push that guideliner through. This is called inchworming. And then after you suck it through, you advance the balloon, you inflate it again, and you keep doing it up until you get your guideliner all across the area you want. You can get it across the lesion fully, and then you take that balloon out and position a stent inside the guideliner, then pull back the guideliner as if you're unsheathing the stent and deploy it. So you can do that in swarming technique. Another technique that I found, that I have found in some cases more effective than in swarming is what we call balloon anchoring technique, meaning you inflate the balloon in the vessel, and as the balloon is inflated, and grabbing that wire and the whole wire catheter system, then you advance the guide liner. Uh, so either one of those techniques can be used in complex cases. Keep in mind, evidently, there is more risk of vessel injury when you use those techniques. So you have to be experienced and careful. Uh, Another idea that, okay, well, I mentioned you, want, you can you advance the guide liner over the wire into the guide tip. Then you advance a balloon in that system deep. Then you advance the guide liner. Advance a balloon, then you advance the guide liner over it. Well, how about if you're using over the wire balloon or over the wire catheter? So in this case, you're not going to be able to advance your over the wire uh, catheter uh, over a short wire in a guideliner. So what you need to do in those cases, the best way is to assemble all three, the guideliner, the short wire, and the long uh, over the wire catheter to assemble, them, assemble all of them uh, outside the body. So you put outside the body, the guideliner, you advance a balloon catheter over the wire, and you put both into the hole of that monorail portion of the guideliner, you advance them through it, then you put those into the two of the guide, you advance the wire and the catheter, then you advance the guide liner over them, okay? Um, so that's one technique when you're using over the wire balloon or over the wire catheter, assemble them and advance them into the guide liner outside the body, then you put them all three 
through the TUI into the guide and you advance the wire catheter, then you advance the guideline over them. Okay, it, be it becomes the same steps afterwards. Um, all right, another idea regarding the guideliner, I mentioned it earlier. Again, six French guideliner is like five French guides. So the inner diameter of a guideliner is, is like one to two French smaller than in it, the inner diameter of the guide. And it gets worse, it gets worse with bigger, uh, bigger uh, sizes. I used to think seven French guide liner is like six French guide, but I realized the hard way that it's actually not six French guide. It's a little smaller. It's 5.7 French guide. And that makes a difference. It can make it hard to do kissing balloons through a seven French guide liner. Eight French guide liner is like a six French guide. Okay, so there is minus two at the eight French guide liner level, minus almost one and a half at the seven French guide liner. So again, cannot do kissing balloon through a six French guideliner, can do one balloon with body wires. So you cannot do any kissing balloon, one balloon with two wires. That's the maximum you can fit in a six French guideliner. You can do kissing balloon through seven French guideliner only with small balloons, less than two millimeters with difficulty. So you cannot do big kissing balloon into a seven French guideliner because it's like a 5.7 French guide. You cannot fit simultaneous stand balloon in a seven French guide liner. I explained in the past that you can fit simultaneous stand balloon in a six French guide, as long as your stand and balloon are three millimeters or less. But you cannot do in a seven French guide liner because it's 0.3 French smaller than a six French guide. So you cannot do it. Uh, you can fit like I said, small kissing balloons in seven French guide liner, not big kissing balloons, small kissing balloon or small simultaneous balloons. Uh, you can also fit uh, with difficulty a support catheter like micro catheter, Mamba Flex with anchor balloon. Uh, so catheter and balloon in a seven French guide liner. So another idea, which we did in this case, okay, I showed you from the up front here, I advanced my guide liner over two wires. Okay, now how do you advance guide liner over two wires? So don't think, or when you have two wires, how do you advance your guide liner? So you have to advance the guide liner over both wires at the back end, outside the body. So here you have two wires coming out of the body, out of the two. You put your guide liner over both wires and both wires will come out of the monorail. So yeah, you have to advance the guide liner over both wires. You cannot advance the guide liner over one wire. There is no room. If you have body wires and you advance the guide liner of, you choose one wire and you advance it over one wire, it will not go because there is not enough room in the six French guide liner between the six French guide liner and six French guide to fit that other wire sitting as body. So you have to advance it over both or take away the body wire and advance it over one wire if that's what you want, okay? So it has to go over both wires. And this is where you get that nice support that I use routinely, guide liner over body wires. That's my basic support. I use it frequently nowadays in radial uh, cases. Um, so another thing is, okay, let's say you have a guide liner in place and you want to use the power of a body wire with a guide liner in place. Well, you cannot advance a body wire I don't have a picture, but you cannot advance a body wire while a guide liner is already in place. So if you want to have a body wire on top of a guide liner, you have to take the guide liner out, rewire the lesion with another body wire, then re-advance the guide liner over both wires. Then of course you advance a balloon over one of the wires and you track the guide liner over it. Another idea about guide liner, uh, and you can see it here, in this case. So guide liner is in sync with your guide. You can imagine both as one unit, unless again, you advance it too much outside of the monorail portion, outside that 25 centimeter monorail or 13 centimeter in case of trap liner. So they are in sync. So it's not infrequent in complex cases to make, make that sync unit as an amplatz. So I'm creating an amplatz. This is how the guide was. 
And this is how it became. It became an amplat sitting on the valve. So this is how you can create an amplat with a standard guide. You can do it with a Jutkins catheter. You know, you're not getting enough support with the Jutkins, but you plan, okay, Jutkins has been the guide that was, for example, the easiest to, to engage the artery in one particular case. Well, it's not giving me a lot of support, but it's okay. I'm going to add a guideliner and make my Jutkins like an amplatz using the guideliner, okay? It's okay to have this. Some people get scared that the guide is hanging in the aorta. No, don't worry too much. You know, as long as you have substantial portion of that guideliner still in the guide uh, to provide a robust body, um, uh, you know, don't worry about it. This is your new uh, amplatz unit, guide, guideliner in an amplatz fashion. The guide is hanging here in the aorta, which is again, okay. All right. Um, I will describe just body wiring and um, anchor balloons. So types of body wire, there are two types of body wire, body wire in a side branch, body wire coaxial distally. If you have issues of delivering uh, balloon or stent to the lesion, distal body wire is best. If issues with keeping the guide engaged, then side body is okay. Uh, types of body balloons, which is better called, which are better called anchor balloons. There are two types of anchor balloon. You have like body wires, you have what we call uh, coaxial anchor balloon, and uh, you have the side branch uh, body balloon or anchor balloon. This is the one more commonly used. This one is better, but evidently, this cannot be used in cases where you cannot even advance a balloon. This is useful in cases where you cannot advance a stent. So what you do, you know, I'm able to advance a balloon across a lesion, but I cannot advance a stent. So what you do, you advance a balloon distally, you inflate it, that will grab both wires. And then you advance a stent over the other wire. So this is the coaxial distal anchor balloon. This is a better technique when you have trouble advancing the stent, although this can work as well. But this is a better technique if you can. It will give you more support coaxially into the area you want to stent. All right, I will move. I described guideliner. Uh, I will move to microcatheter description, which is the second axis of support, microcatheters. So there are four types of microcatheter used for support. And there is a fifth type that is not particularly used for support, but it's used for uh, double wiring. I described it in, um, in, in the bifurcation talks. It is what we call the dual lumen catheter, Sasuke and twin pass. Those are useful for side branch, difficult side branch wiring, whether it be for stenting the main branch or afterward. But for support, those are the main four types of uh, catheter. So you have low profile balloon. The lowest profile balloon and actually the lowest profile catheter out of those four is a Sapphire Pro one millimeter balloon. Uh, you have also threader and a glider balloon. Uh, in all those, when I describe them, uh, I will describe, I will mention, you'll see me mention the tip entry profile, the very distal portion of it and the distal shaft. There is discrepancy, meaning sometimes the tip will engage, but you'll have to advance the shaft, the distal shaft, which is a little bigger. So sometimes the tip engages, but the shaft doesn't go. But they are tapered in a way to allow that transition, usually, okay? So uh, out of those balloons, a glider is also a very low profile, not much talked about, but it's a very good balloon because it's very low profile, a uh, very small tip, and it's also braided like those catheters. So it's torqueable and it is uh, hydrophilic and it's designed to slip between stent cells. So very good balloon, okay? And another, you know, technique in the low profile balloon is to do balloon rupture on purpose. Go high pressure with one of those balloon uh, and that rupture will see contrast at high pressure we see the balloon contrast as a high pressure and potentially uh, modify the lesion and make it softer. So uh, the other type of catheter is the low profile solid catheter, like fine cross and caravel. Those are not braided and cannot be torqued. 
those are the more important catheter, the low profile catheter with a screw and torque mechanism. And there are three big brands, Mamba Flex, Corsair Pro X XS and Turnpike LP. They have very small tip, although usually not as small as a sapphire balloon, but they have a screw mechanism and uh, their distal shaft is bigger than those, than the low profile solid catheter. That's why on occasion, you, even though those catheters don't have screw mechanism, because they have a smaller distal shaft, on occasion you can advance that in a lesion if you're not able to advance this one. Then you have the low profile catheter that are higher profile with a screw and torque mechanism. It's the same three, but higher uh, distal shaft profile. So they have the same tip profile, but a bigger transition. So Mamba, Corsair Pro and Turnpike. They will give you more support, but they may be more difficult to advance because of that distal shaft that is larger. Uh, one thing here, there is no general rule which one to try first. I prefer to try first those, but you can alternate. Sometimes this will go across a lesion while this does not, or vice versa. This may fail to advance while this does, or this may fail to advance while this does. So you can alternate between those four categories. Generally speaking, this will be the least likely to enter a lesion, although that will be the most likely to give you uh, support for further distal wiring. For example, in, in cases of CTO wiring, those will be the ones to give you the most support, but those are the ones that will be more likely to engage a difficult to cross lesion. All right. Uh, this is just some picture of the Corsair Pro. Uh, and this is another uh, picture of the Mamba catheter. Both Corsair and Mamba and Turnpike, they, are, they consist of braided interlaced wires like a screw. Mamba has 11 individually tapered wires uh, that are interlaced and that extend from the hub to the tip. Wires taper at the distal tip which uh, you know, makes the distal shaft and the entry tip more flexible. So it allows you to enter with a low profile, then the braided interlacing allow you to screw into that lesion with a higher profile distal shaft. This shows you again a picture of that, that small taper distal tip and the larger distal shaft. So the tip entry profile is 1.4 French, but the distal shaft is anywhere between 2.1 to 2.4 French usually. One important technique of how to use those micro catheters, those ones that have a screw mechanism, those one, the first two, those are just pushed. This one, this one can be torqued, but you know, for the most part, those are just pushed. Those two are torqued into the lesion. So this is how you do it. You have a catheter over the wire. And what you do with both, you put one hand here and the front part or one hand in the back and you spin very fast, five to 10 times in a clockwise fashion. Then you reverse five to 10 times in a counterclock fashion while giving a slight push forward. So this is how you're creating your screw into the vessel, five to 10, one way, five to 10 the other way. You have to torque it with a slight, with keeping slight forward push. The single most important thing in that maneuver is to spin very fast. The faster you spin, the more likely you are to screw that lesion and be able to advance it. So you have to spin very fast. The more likely you are to transmit that spin. So you have to do it very fast. Uh, when you're spinning, you know, obviously you're not having any hand on that wire. So the pinky uh, finger will be holding the wire. The pinky finger of that hand will be holding the wire. Then you'll be spinning fast with both those hands. Keep in mind another idea, as you can see in this picture, all those catheter are mainly over the wire catheters. They are not monorail catheter. They are over the wire. Evidently over the wire will give you more support and more pushability. The balloons are available in monorail. Uh, so that's, an, uh, you know, at times you may need to use the monorail system and that's one advantage of those. Uh, but overwhelmingly, they are over the wire catheter. And for that reason, uh, 
this is a picture, you need to use something called a trapper to exchange those devices. Because we like to work with short wires and how can you advance and pull out a, a, you know, a long catheter over the wire catheter over a short wire, a standard wire. So how can you do that? Well, the, you know, one, you can use a long wire and this way you can pull it out and advance it over a long wire, 300 centimeter wire, but we don't like that. So we like to exchange using what we call a trapper balloon. So it's a balloon that you advance it through the guide, not over the wire, you just advance it bare through the guide alongside the wires, not over them. And you advance it in order to trap the wires and allow safe pullback and safe advancement of catheters for exchange while that trapper balloon is inflated. You, advance, you inflate it to about 14 to 18 atmosphere. Okay, so you, you inflate it while pulling out the mamba. You know, you'll be pulling it out even though you don't have wires anymore. You're just pulling it out, yet the wire will not get pulled because the trapper is trapping that wire in place, even if you're not holding it anymore. The same thing when you're advancing, you advance safely up until the trapper uh, balloon portion, then you deflate the trapper and you advance the catheter in a usual fashion while holding the wire. So, but you need to know how to use that trapper because also size is an issue with trapper as I've learned in difficult cases. And that can make, that can make your case more challenging if you uh, try to advance devices with a trapper in place when the system will not fit everything. For example, trapper is difficult to advance in six French system when you have two wires and one catheter, but it is feasible. For example, you want to advance and pull back Mamba and you want to put a trapper to trap those, uh, that system. There is enough room in a six French guide, but it is very tight. So keep that in mind. You will meet a lot of resistance. Uh, Another idea, okay, now we have Guideliner, we're adding another device into our space here. So we have Guide, Guideliner. You can position a trapper and a catheter, let's say a Mamba or a balloon catheter. You can position one wire, one catheter, Guideliner and a trapper. So you can use trapper when you have those three here. However, you cannot do trapper with in a six French system when you have guideliner, two wires and one catheter. So if you have body wires and you're trying to advance a balloon catheter in a patient with a body wire and a guideliner, you cannot use trapper. Okay, so in those cases, you have to pull out one of your body wires uh, or you have to use long wires and use the traditional ex exchange uh, walking out the catheter over a long wire. So keep that in mind. Another idea is, even regardless of the guideliner, if you, if you don't have a guideliner, a trapper is difficult to advance in a seven French system when you have two wires and two catheters, okay? So again, the more devices you have, the more difficult it will be to advance a trapper. The standard trapper is one wire, one catheter in a six French system, one wire, one catheter. And trapper can be used in six, seven, and eight French, but in six French is where you encounter most of the difficulty. So one wire, one catheter it can fit two wires, one catheter, but not if you have guideliner on top for sure. And not if you want a balloon, two wires and two balloons. And I found difficulty, you know, when we use dual lumen catheter, we, by definition, we have a catheter and two, two wires. We're using it typically to advance a side branch wire. And so in a six French system, I've had issues uh, advancing the trapper and pulling it out over a trapper. There is, you know, you can do it and it's done, but keep in mind, it's difficult to use with a dual lumen catheter, which is even more problematic because dual lumen catheter is the catheter where to me, it's most important to use a trapper because you're pulling out the dual lumen catheter, which I explained in um, my wire and in bifurcation talks, you're pulling that dual lumen catheter after you get your wire in place in a side branch, you're pulling a dual lumen catheter over two wires. It's very hard to keep those two wires in place, but yet this is where trapper can be hard to use, but it's usable. Keep that in mind. 
So keep those ideas in mind as we're uh, talking. What is hard inside Guideliner would be impossible. Here I describe what you cannot do inside the Guideliner. Well, that will be impossible if you want to add a trapper on top. You know, it may be hard for you to memorize all this. I suggest you review them and try to practice them in your mind. I wrote them down uh, because that will be very handy to you in cases. You don't want to discover this in the middle of the case. You know, you're trying to advance trapper. It's not going then. Now you have to pull it out and the process, you can start losing devices. It will make your case uh, and add, it will add to the uh, burden of your case. Okay, so back to the case I was doing. What did we do? So um, again, we tried with, as I explained, with Sapphire Pro, then MembaFlex, with an Amplatzing, the Guideliner, uh, no success. So here is what, I what we decided to do. What I decided to do, again, you don't need to go through all the steps. I decided to do laser atherectomy because I took into account that this patient likely has heavy uh, fibrosis. So I decide to do laser and I'll explain to you laser briefly. We use laser. It's a monorail catheter. It's the easiest atherectomy device to use. Uh, I use the smallest profile laser, 0.9 millimeter, which fits in a six French catheter easily. You can on inject contrast around it as you're positioning it. Uh, and there are two numbers when we're talking about laser. There is the energy, which we call fluence. Typically we use 60 to 80. And there is a frequency of the energy in hertz, which is usually 80. Typically, I use those numbers, 0 0.9, 80, and 80, if you want to remember laser setup. Uh, laser has the advantage of being advanced over any wire you choose. You don't need like rotablator or orbital atherectomy specialty wire. What laser does, it delivers high frequency UV light, which creates heat that vaporizes the plaque. It also creates vapor bubbles that explode. This is what we call photomechanical effect. It, is, it can be used in heavy fibrosis, but also in moderate calcium, not heavy calcium. It's good in calcium, but not heavy calcium. Uh, you need the other ones uh, for heavy calcium. Uh, typically, it's also used in underexpanded stent to create explosions behind the stent and allow stent expansion. It's safer to use an underexpanded stent than using a rotational or orbital atherectomy. Typically laser, so we advance that device using those fluence, that setup, fluence and frequency. Usually as you're advancing your device, you run saline during laser uh, to create those effects in a safe fashion. But if you want to create larger and more explosive bubbles, you run the laser in a milieu of blood. So you, keep, you don't run saline, you let it run in blood, that will create more explosive bubbles, or in more extreme cases, you can run it while injecting contrast. That will create uh, massive bubbles, particularly useful in those uh, resistant under-expanded stents. So those are the three types of uh, milieu for laser, saline, blood, and contrast. Uh, another thing, uh, we can upsize to be more aggressive besides using those three steps. You can upsize 1.4 and 1.7 millimeter. This one needs seven French. Uh, or contrast, okay? So we tried laser. I tried it in a safe fashion, 0 0.9, 80, and 80. I used it in blood. However, that did not allow our lesion to yield. Uh, that did not allow our lesion to yield, and the, the, the laser catheter could not cross into the distal vessel as well, okay? Can we do rotablation? It is an option. I'm always anxious about using rotablator through stent cells there is a higher risk of, uh, a, you know, a burr um, getting stuck. You, you may be able to cross, but you may not be able to pull that burr back. So I'm always anxious about using rotablator through stent cells. In general, rotablation versus laser, they probably have the same safety profile in general, but I think laser is safer uh, in, um, in, in, across stents. Uh, they both have, in general, not uh, through stents, they both have kind of the same risk of perforation. Uh, another advantage of laser being it is um, easier to set up and it's lower profile, easier to advance in general. Uh, so 
okay, so we weren't able to advance the laser. We hoped it did something, even though it wasn't able to advance. We hope we delivered from that tip something that softened that lesion. Anyway, we tried rewiring again, and this time, so we went to that fourth axis. We tried support, we tried microcatheter. Now we went to that fourth axis, rewiring through stent cells. So we tried changing tip shape. Uh, I tried using the next step. I use super cross angle catheter. We typically use mostly that 120 degree catheter. And maybe to direct me in a different cell of that LED stent. And here I use two ideas. I use super cross to direct me into a different cell. And that also provided me with parallel wiring. While the first while was plugging that hole that may be an unfavorable hole that we keep going through, I use a super cross to direct me into a different cell while the first wire was plugging the unfavorable hole. So parallel wiring and super cross to direct me away from the unfavorable hole now plugged with a wire. That did not help us by itself. So what we did, we did the same thing after switching to a femoral axis, seven French. So we did seven French femoral axis with seven French guideliner. And we did that body wiring coaxially with parallel wiring. And then at this point, we were able to advance the Mamba Flex. We still, we still could not advance Sapphire Pro but we were able to advance Mamba Flex. So I think it's a combination of everything, all the techniques together, even the laser that didn't seem to work helped in some, some ways. So better support, seven French, seven French guideliner, femoral, um, we use laser, body parallel wiring. So body wiring coaxially instead of in a side branch, uh, eventually Mamba works. Sapphire Pro still could not be advanced. We need to advance the balloon. Eventually, what worked, we had to do to advance that Sapphire Pro, we had to position anchor balloon. So we ended up, we cannot do anchor balloon in the main vessel. Evidently, we cannot advance the balloon. So we rewired again this time into the side branch, the diagonal. We inflated the balloon, a 2.5 millimeter balloon, and we were able to advance the Pro, Sapphire Pro balloon. So while this balloon is inflated, we pushed that sapphire balloon and we were able finally to cross it. Now here, can you fit double wire? Oh, you have to think that in, my, in your mind as you're doing this. Can I fit two wires, two balloon into a seven French guy liner? Yes, you can, but not 2.5 millimeter balloon. And we learned that here. Uh, so actually I had to take the guy liner out to position an anchor 2.5 millimeter balloon. Alternatively, I could have used a smaller balloon, like two millimeter balloon, and it will probably, it probably would have fit. Okay. But keep those ideas in mind as you're doing it. Otherwise you'll be extending an already quite long and tedious case. Okay. Uh, anyway, so we were able to be successful, uh, eventually here. Another idea. Uh, is, okay, you want to use your, okay, they decided I want to use my guide liner while I'm doing my anchor balloon. Well, I cannot use trapper. You know, you won't have room to do trapper balloon to trap your devices while you have a guide liner and two, um, you know, body, two balloons, you know, two balloons and two wires. There won't be space. And that's uh, another reason why we, we prefer to take the guide liner out in that case while we're doing anchor balloon in order to use the trapper. You have to keep those ideas in mind. Very, very important, okay? Trapper, difficult to advance seven French when you have two wires, two catheter, and impossible if you have a guide liner on top of that, okay? What is hard inside guide liner would be impossible if you want to add trapper on top. All right, so. Uh, <clears throat> finally, we crossed, and after doing all this, now it became easy. We did progressive dilatation, uh, 2.5, 2.75 millimeter balloon. Then uh, we decided to do here, finish the culotte that they started eight years ago. They did semi-culotte. Now, after we were able to balloon those stent cells, our plan was to finish the culotte. So we positioned the stent here. Then we did the steps of a culotte. We did proximal pot followed by 
And remember, the pot balloon should be small and should not extend beyond the carina. So we did proximal pot with a 3.5 large balloon, 3.5 millimeter large in diameter, small, uh, short in length. Then we rewired the diagonal through the stent cells, as you can see here, through the fresh new stent cells. Then we did a sequential kissing balloons, high pressure, 2.5 millimeter in the diagonal, uh, three millimeter in the LAD, and then simultaneous kissing balloon, lower pressure, uh, 10 to 12 atmosphere. And we had a great result at the end, okay? All right, um, this is just a reminder when you have a cell diagonal, you, you can do that semi culotte if you absolutely have to stand. It is uh, my favorite technique. If I have to stand, again, try not to stand a cell diagonal. But if you have to stand, you, you often have to land in the LED in a semi culotte fashion. I often balloon those stent cells to avoid, potentially, avoid uh, building tissue across the LAD with time, neointimal hyperplasia over the LAD with time, and to open the stent cells into the LAD. And this is how I like to end my result. Now, if you don't get a good result across the LED, you get bad plaque shift, or if later on you develop disease in the LAD, as happened in our case, then you can finish the culotte. You can do the full culotte instead of half culotte, okay? You can also do inverted tap, we call a reverse tap, uh, where you don't make your stent touch the proximal LAD. Uh, but uh, the problem with the uh, inverted tap, that angle has to be favorable. Our angle wasn't. You know, that angle has to be, you know, less, more than 45 degrees, uh, typically. It depends on the vessel size. You may do it with 45 degree if your LAD is very large uh, and your diagonal is large. But anyway, in this case, this is what this was more favorable. Uh, I would like to describe a briefly another case uh, where we did all those support steps. So this is just another illustration. This is a short CTO of a left circumflex that we tried before radially and we realized it will be very hard to cross this lesion with balloons and stents. So we brought the patient back from ephemeral access, we use upfront seven French EBU, seven French guideliner, wire and mamba. So we, like I explained before, I put my guide, then I loaded outside the body, uh, a wire inside a mamba catheter, a short wire inside a mamba catheter. Then I put those through the guideliner. I advanced all three catheters in sync, all three devices in sync through my guide catheters. Okay, so I uploaded those outside the body. Okay, so we advanced this and we use the Fielder XT wire and the Mamba Flex catheter. So we crossed the lesion with the Fielder XT, but I could not track the Mamba Flex over it, despite guideliner and despite seven French femoral. It was easy to cross the lesion, but we could not cross a balloon over it. Uh, so here we'll go over the steps. So we tried Corsair, we tried another brand of support catheter. We tried not just a Mamba Flex, we tried the regular Mamba, uh, maybe not a great idea because if Mamba Flex doesn't cross, it's unlikely that the Mamba that has a larger distal profile, it's unlikely for it to cross. Uh, it's better for support. Uh, if your wire is not able to cross, Mamba could provide, provide you better support than Mamba Flex. But if your Mamba Flex cannot cross, if the issue of catheter crossing, uh, probably um, Mamba is not a good idea. Anyway, we tried those. We tried Sapphire Pro and Threader Balloons with no success. Uh, we tried uh, eventually a body wire into an atrial branch, not a coaxial body wire, but a body wire into an atrial branch with a deep guideliner that you see here all the way. And we tried the over-the-wire Sapphire Pro with the body wire in place. Again, no success. Keep in mind, like I explained earlier, well, how did I get that body wire? Okay, we had our mamba and wire here. How did I get a, a body wire? You have guideliner in place. You cannot advance a body wire through a guideliner. 
you can advance guideliner over body wire, but you cannot advance body wire into guideliner. So what you need to do in this case, I had to pull the guideliner all the way out. Then I wired, I advanced and wired the atrial branch. Then I advanced the guideliner over both wires. And evidently when you advance guideliners over both wires, you can only advance it to the point where those wires split evidently. Anyway, we did that. We still could not advance a balloon uh, or a mamba. Eventually what worked, like in the prior case, what worked is anchor balloon. We did a two millimeter balloon in that atrial branch. And we had uh, our guideline, we kept our guideliner in. We had two wires. We advanced one wire, uh, one balloon as an anchor balloon or body balloon into the atrial branch. And then we were able to advance the sapphire probe. So we had the guideliner and two balloon. Seven French guideliner, like I explained, can fit two balloons as long as they are two millimeters or less. So we were able to advance those, uh, okay, with the guideliner in place. However, keep in mind the other step of those complex cases is always think guideliner and trapper in those complex cases. You know, you're using microcatheter, you need a trapper. Okay, well, and you need guideliner. Well, unfortunately, there was no, no, no room. And it's good to know it up front, like I explained earlier. So we had to take the trapper out to fit two balloon and guideliner. Well, luckily here, since we're using balloons, okay, since I had to take the trapper out, well, I cannot use over the wire microcatheter or balloons anymore. So I didn't venture trying to advance Mamba because to use Mamba, I need a trapper, okay? It's an over the wire catheter. So in this case, Luckily, the balloons, and that's uh, one advantage of those low-profile balloons, they also come in monorail. So we use two monorail balloons through the guideliner without a trapper. And we were able to advance that balloon, okay? Um, so if this did not work, you would ask me, so what could we do? Another option here, my next step would have been on that uh, on that algorithm, those are three uh, types of support or those three types of step. My next step here would have been laser atherectomy. It didn't look heavily calcified. Laser would have been my option. At institution where you don't have laser, rotation atherectomy is okay. It would work also in fibrotic tissue, even if it's not uh, heavily calcified. So I wouldn't use orbital atherectomy if I'm not heavily calcified, but you can use rotational if laser is not available at your institution. Okay, so that would have been my next step. Another thing I thought of doing is to, if I still couldn't advance the Corsair with the anchor, uh, sorry, if I couldn't advance the small sapphire balloon with the anchor balloon in place, I would have tried to explode, to burst basically that small sapphire pro and hope that will soften the lesion for me. So that would have been my next step beside laser potentially. Okay, because I had tried all those, all those support measures already. Okay. Uh, another thing you could have tried is to do coaxial uh, parallel wiring and, um, you know, see if that could, um, you know, if that could have provided you a different sort of support to advance your devices. Here. All right. So that's the idea. Now we were able to cross and eventually we dilated it progressively. Um, then it became easy. We stented it uh, with a good result, uh, no issues. Uh, and we can see we did IVUS before we stent. I just want to see why it was so hard to cross. It is not calcified like, we, like it looked angiographically. It's just very heavily fibrotic plaque. As you can see, this is fibrotic. There is no calcium. There is no shadowing. It's just a tissue that is almost as bright as the adventitia, which usually indicates fibrosis, okay? It's a fibrotic, um, echogenic plaque, okay? I will stop here.